Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started with today's webinar, Easing the Inventory Accounting Burden uh, with SIN7 and our guest here, Accountfully, as well as our another guest I'll tell you about in just a second. So today we're going to be talking about what makes inventory accounting complex and how to address it. Uh, we'll dive into how the right inventory management solution can help, and we'll have a conversation with the customer. My name is Steven Selgrade, Marketing Director at SIN7. I'm just the host. Shortly, I'm going to turn it over to the, to the smarter folks on the call here. We have Brad Ebenhoe, CEO of Accountfully, Kevin Bukowski, Account Exec at SIN7, and then our final guest, we're really excited to talk to a customer, Keely Tillotson, uh, Operational Consultant at Ground Up. And I will turn it over to you, Brad. Well, nice to meet everybody. <clears throat> Just as a way of introduction, um, Brad Ebeno, CEO of Accountly, as Stephen mentioned, Accountly, we are uh, essentially an outsourced accounting department that uh, specializes um, in emerging brands, CPG. Um, and, and as we've uh, specialized that from an accounting perspective, we've got a, a lot of, of inventory-based clients. Um, we've been around for over a decade and, and work with a lot of, a lot of brands um, uh, across the nation. Um, and so, uh, as we go through this chat, um, kind of, I'll chat on kind of five, six, seven different complexities from um, accounting for inventory, and we'll go through there. And then Kevin will mention how uh, Sin7 can um, help solve uh, some of these uh, issues for your Sin7 core, I guess, uh, which used to be dear. So, uh, kind of complexity number one, um, just from an accounting perspective, uh, specific to inventories, how many kind of chart of accounts to have on the inventory and or COGS account, cost to get sold account side, right? Would you like one big inventory account or would you like several uh, COGS accounts and, and how many accounts would you have? Um, <clears throat> when we start with a lot of our clients and brands, we talk about keeping things as simple as possible and, and sufficient for what you can basically account for, right? A lot of our clients that start out, we have just one base inventory account that includes everything, right? Raw material, work in progress, finished goods, packaging, et cetera, everything that you're paying for as well as on the COGS side. It keeps it as simple as possible, right? So kind of a bullet point or a thing to think about is, as you identify, should I have one big account or, or many accounts, is how complex is your supply chain? Um, it may make sense to keep track of all the tiny factors affecting your margins, right? So if you're able to account and, 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 and have a system or anything like that that can help you manage it is having raw materials, having work in progress, having finished goods, and even finished goods broken out further on the inventory or balance sheet, that could really help out from a reporting standpoint. But are you able to actually account um, for that from an accurate, you know, an accurate time, uh, an accurate manner? Same thing on the cost of goods sold sign. It'd be great to break out, you know, how much of your COGS was related to labor, was related to the product, um, of freight, et cetera, as well as even different types of SKUs you may have. Um, again, it, it, it's a factor to think about in terms of what your chart of accounts should look like. Um, as reporting requirements become more complex, do you have the right accounting skills to prevent mistakes? Again, if you're doing things in, in a spreadsheet, how do you ensure what's right from a raw material, packaging, work in progress, finished goods standpoint? Um, one thing to think about is um, as you start to kind of possibly, uh, you know, look, look for getting loans or, 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 or fundraising or equity, uh, uh, you know, raising money, some of those folks require or want more complex or, or you know, delineated inventory accounts as well as cost of goods sold, sale, uh, sold account. Um, but just something to think about here. So moving on to the next complexity. Number two, timing of sales versus the shipping. Um, so number one is just when to actually account for revenue or, or sale, right? So when should you account for the sale of the product in, in your you know, books and records? Um, Kind of the example that we use basically is we recognize the the ship date is the date of the sale, right? So the day the product leaves your your warehouse, your three PO, that's when it's revenue on, on the books. Um, and we do that even if we use an inventory management system or we don't. Um, that's basically the right way to do it. But also, if you account for revenue before it's actually shipped out, and there's let's say it's over a two month period, and there's some issues there or uh, over, uh, uh, you know, the, the sale date was February, the shipping date was in March, and there's a time period there. But when you're doing an actual inventory count, 
for February, if you've already sold the product in your books, but it's still there, then there's going to be an inaccuracy or discrepancy there. So deviations and dates between the invoice date and ship date affect financial reporting. Again, the invoice dates revenue, the ship date affects COGS um, and setting a standard is key. So at the end of the day, just as you like uh, start brainstorming or thinking about, you know, accounting for sales and shipping dates and things like that, like how would you account for that? If you look into like QuickBooks online, if you just use that, basically the sale date and the shipping date are the same exact date and on the same transaction. Whereas if you get to an like inventory system like Deers and Seven Core, those two dates can change based upon the actual revenue date versus the shipping date, like from an actual transactional standpoint. So just making sure you have a good process for that. Complexity number three, sales channels and their reports. So um, more sales channels means more revenue, but also more sales reporting complexity, right? So as we kind of go through and brainstorm various sales channels that exist, right? On your website, majority of the users are, are using Shopify these days, right? On Amazon, <clears throat> selling on their platform. What about selling in Mabel and Fair, um, as well as uh, uh, different reseller platforms um, if you're not in the uh, kind of the food and drink space? Um, there's just a lot more complexity that exists. We have clients that don't sell that much, maybe a couple hundred grand of revenue annually, but are in like 10 different sales channels. And every one of them provides complexity and time and effort in order to properly and accurately account from uh, an accounting perspective and financial reporting perspective. So overall, the more sales channels means more revenue, but also means just much more complexity. Bullet point two here is one aspect I really want to kind of uh, challenge and have you all think about is really like, do you know the gross revenue for each channel? So let, let's walk through a couple of things, specifically, let's say Amazon, right? Um, Amazon FBA, um, they're fulfilling your products, they're selling it, they're doing a lot of the work. Well, guess what? Every two weeks, you get a deposit in, right? When If people, some of our, some brands, are you accounting for that and putting that right to revenue, that deposit you got from Amazon? Or are you kind of, putting it over in a holding or clearing account and then actually accounting for actual gross revenues, right? So let's kind of talk about that. They're giving you a net amount of what they owe you after what you sold, less all the fees and transaction, you know, costs that are taken out. So a lot of clients that come to us have this basically cash basis number of their, of their revenue, but they don't actually have it grossed up to what was actually sold, which is more important from what is my top line revenue for my brand and understanding from a financial reporting and P&L standpoint. So for example, recognizing, you know, from a, a structural standpoint on your profit and loss statement, gross revenue, sales of product um, that you sold times like the gross, you know, sale price for that product. Then you go down to net revenue, which is basically after you've taken out discounts, deductions, et cetera, from those sales, right? And then on top of that, like what else is taken out that Amazon's taken out, right? Credit card fees or merchant fees, uh, pick, pack and ship, um, shipping costs, um, chargebacks, that type of stuff, right? And then the amount that you have left over is what they deposit it. Well, if you account for that for your revenue or gross revenue, you're missing a lot of information for you to help you understand what is my gross revenue and what really am I uh, getting after my landed costs and everything for my product. So that goes to bullet point three, like are you including all the costs associated with each channel? So just understanding all the costs, how you get paid from those channels and if there's already costs taken out of those products or those deposits you get and then making sure you're adding them back up, right? So um, if you're kind of looking at that, as you can see, then that brings complexities for each different situation, whether you're getting paid every two weeks by Amazon or whether you're getting paid every day in credit card deposits from what you made on your website or if you're just getting paid directly for a wholesale invoice for your customer. And then point number four here, just skews just kind of your SKU number, your unique identifier for each SKU on Amazon, on Shopify, on Fair, on Mabel, on, you know, on uh, uh, overstock.com, wherever you're selling, right? Are they different across those uh, sales channels or are they same on your website? So if they're different, it can be really hard of understanding and how to account for sales by product as a whole, as an organization um, within just QuickBooks Online, let's say, as well as accounting for like all those products on a, on a cost of goods sold basis. So overall, like this is sales channels. And, and if you just think kind of inherently, oh, let's go and sell in every sales channel that exists and let's go and get our product out there. Well, there adds a lot of complexity from an accounting and financial reporting standpoint. Moving on to complexity number four. Thanks, Brad. I'm actually going to bring in oh, Ken real go. quick oh, yeah. um, to kind of talk about how inventory management software can can help with that complexity you just talked about. So 
I'll turn it real quick over to Kevin and then, and then back to you, Brad. Sounds yeah. good. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, just like Brad was mentioning, as you add those sales channels, that complexity increases um, across the business. And what Core allows you to do is take those connections. And as you can see on the screen here, we have over 40 uh, native integrations with the system, not counting ones that are connected through Zapier or our open API, but brings those connections into one centralized location. Um, this is going to allow you to create automation as those orders come in, map those SKUs. So when you do have SKUs on different platforms, um, we can map those all back to a single SKU in Core. Um, this automation not only helps streamline the processes throughout the business, but gives you accurate data. We're not manually entering those into a specific, one system or multiple systems. When, with that accurate data, it allows us to now pull reports easily in the system. So if we take a look at our next slide here, we have a just a screenshot of a, a sales overview report in our system. These reports can be generated across sales, inventory, purchasing, production, and they're all pivot tables allowing you to pull in different attributes to really customize that report to your needs. Um, these reports then can be auto, um, automation set to be emailed to an individual or group of people um, on a, a, a specific cadence throughout the business. And I'll send it over back to Brad to talk about complexity number four. Thanks for sharing that um, information. <clears throat> all right, complexity number four, how, how do you uh, account for the previews or the samples and, and to make sure they're properly accounted for? Um, you know, the first bullet point here to kind of think about is samples, testers, spoilage, breakage, they're all inventory assets that never get sold, right? So if you're accounting for them properly, they go on the balance sheet as inventory. And since they're never an actual product being sold, right? Like how do they get over in the profit and loss statement is basically the, the point here. And, and are you keeping track of these items? Number two is samples and giveaways and promo items, they're marketing and advertising expense. So if you're just doing an adjustment from your inventory account on, on the balance sheet to your cost of goods sold for the difference between the two, then you're artificially increasing your COGS, which decreases your margins because you're not accounting for some of those items that you're selling or that you're giving away for samples, giveaways, and promos. Those should go in your advertising and marketing bucket, right? And you should have a, a good idea and, and, and accounting for those so you understand how much product you're giving away. Is you're getting any ROI on items? Um, like clear, you know, sales and marketing techniques that exist, right? But again, a big part of that is if you don't account for them, you don't know how many you're giving away and if there's sales coming from that. But also you're literally having a lower gross margin because you're putting them to COGS when you're accounting for them versus putting them below COGS in advertising and marketing. Kind of bullet point three here, spoilage or breakage are inevitable. So you just need a process to account for these as well. So essentially, we know things are going to break and spoil. If you don't have a process for them, like how are you going to make sure that that you know you're you're uh, providing solutions to warehouse issues you have, or you have a command or a three pill you're using that keeps breaking things, and, and you're not aware of them, that then you can fix that issue or, or get actually like you know refunded for that or charge uh, reimbursed for those items, right? A big part of that is if you have a good process in place on the spoilage, breakage, leakage, you know, people stealing things or whatever. You can identify trends, right? Is this happening to specific SKUs, specific warehouses? How do we fix this? How do we account for it? Um, all those types of things. So overall here is a big part of accounting for inventory is that not all inventory gets sold. It gets given away from an advertising, marketing, promotion standpoint, as well as you're going to lose, break, uh, get things stolen, et cetera, and, and ensuring you're accounting for them properly so you have visibility to them so then you can properly, um, you know, provide solutions or, or have good reporting um, mechanisms on those. Yeah, and that's exactly where Core comes in to help create those adjustments in the system. So whether, you know, it is a spoilage, breakage, uh, pulling things out for a trade show, you need to be able to track and manage that. So inside Core, we allow you to go in and quickly make a stock adjustment, uh, designating the exact, the correct expense account and adjusting products out of, of inventory and relaying that back to your accounting platform. <clears throat> and then, you know. yep. And then on, on top of that, uh, you know, we, we've got a, a lot of our brands on um, Deers and Seven Core. Um, we may not have that inventory adjustment process exactly like it was just with laid out, but you can customize kind of the workflow or which transaction screens or who inputs them into Deer and Sin 7 um, Core. Just, just be aware of that in terms of, of customizing and fitting to your, your process and workflow um, as well. So complexity number five, again, warehouse locations and landed costs. So a big part when we start with um, 
brand comes working with us, we want to say, hey, number one, as we kind of get an understanding and walking through your supply chain and your inventory kind of process, where do you house inventory at, right? And thinking from a warehouse location standpoint, you're like, oh, we house them at our warehouse or at our 3PL. And it's like, is that the only location? What about, do you sell on Amazon? Yes. Okay. Well, Amazon typically has your product on consignment at their warehouses. So that's technically a warehouse location for you. Do you have product at your office that you may ship out on uh, customer service, uh, you know, refunds or exchanges, or even just for promo? Oh yeah, I do. Like, well, we need to account for those there. What about, are you buying your raw materials that you send your co-man? Yes, that's also true. So then all of a sudden you start adding these up you have four, five, six, seven locations of, of inventory where you initially you may think I just had one or two. Well, we need to account for those properly. And at the same time, how often do I need to account for that, um, the, the inventory in hand at any given location? So bullet point one is just purely like, where is your inventory and how much is in each location at any given time, right? And number of locations. So if you don't have, um, you know, how often are you going to account for the inventory quantities on hand at every one of those locations? Are you going to do it daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, or never, right? Um, that's a big kind of point that you want to figure out, right? Your biggest spend is inventory um, as an inventory-based business. So you should have really good tabs and, 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 and a good process and visibility to these items. Um, number two is once you understand where you have products, but then number two is like the landed cost vary by location or skew, right? So understanding what your landed cost is for your product directly ties your gross margins. Um, what does landed cost mean? Basically it means everything getting, all your costs incurred to getting the product ready to sold warehouse, right? So you're talking about command fees, uh, raw material product, um, uh, packaging, et cetera, freight in, um, all that stuff that gets into a product ready or a warehouse ready to sell. Um, well, does that landed cost vary by the locations that you have your product at and or skew, right? So number one location, one location may have higher, uh, higher freight to get to that product um, ready to sold. Um, some other locations may be, I don't know, international or domestic or, or whatever have freight and duties that exist. Um, same thing on the SKU side. Maybe some SKUs have purchase price variance for raw materials or, or like each uh, the SKU or batch of product that you're creating or, or producing may have one batch maybe higher than the other because the cost of nuts was a lot higher than the last batch you had, right? So uh, understanding the landed cost, does it vary by location and or skew you're selling and or batch or that you're, you're buying your PO, right? So what about by PO, plain versus ship? So are you, um, a lot of times you're getting, uh, you import goods. A lot of times the ships bring them over, that's a lot cheaper, but sometimes you have to rush uh, shipment via plane for whatever reason. Well, guess what? those adjustments or those uh, landed costs for those different batches or purchase orders are completely different. Understanding those so you can make better decisions on when to do that if you have to goes a long way. And then number two here is purchase price variance by raw materials. If you don't have an IMS in place, you may be using an average cost or standard cost. Well, what happens if those price fluctuations exist consistently, right? So thinking about those and how you account for those. Um, and kind of bullet point three is just a, a kind of a summary here of just considering all the costs of getting your product to the warehouse and the customer, right? So we always say to get all the products ready, your warehouse ready to sell, sell affects your gross margin. And then we say all the costs that gets from your, the warehouse to your customer affects your contribution margin. So we can segment those two costs. What includes that? That's shipping to customer, pick, pack, and ship, logistics, fulfillment, credit card fees, all those types of things that come into play. So just making sure you have those kind of segmented and deleting and just kind of broken out so you have visibility to them is, is key to this. So again, where do you house your inventory? What are the costs of all the, the products that you have? Do they vary by location skew? And then what is the full scale, uh, all the costs that you have uh, from buying an inventory to when you actually get you know them to the customer? All right, I'm good with this. Yeah, and then taking a look at you know the multiple locations, you know, receiving your own goods into one workhouse is hard enough, but as you add those locations, as Brad mentioned, whether that's a 3PL, a uh, co-manufacturer consignment location, being able to see those, that inventory in real time at those locations is crucial. And, you know, with our system internally or core with the mobile uh, warehouse management app internally, as you're receiving those goods in, uh, those become available in real time and you can report those back to an individual uh, purchase order. 
At the same time with that mobile app, if they're in those locations or multiple locations internally throughout their business, you're able to do a mobile stock take going through checking on inventory in that case. And then when these are all received into those locations and PO information arrives later, whether it's an invoice, additional landed costs, freight, whatever that looks like, you could go in and designate those costs to a specific uh, purchase order throughout the process. Um, so Core really gives you that ability to see all those locations in one centralized location, really really helping streamline the business um, from an automation perspective and just overall visibility. Let's take a look now at complexity number six. All right, complexity number six, prepaid inventory or unbuilt inventory. So what does that mean? Number one, prepaid inventory. Money's going out the door for inventory that you'll receive at a later time frame. Um, accounting for that is always uh, kind of complex from our perspective in relation to, hey, money's going out, I should have inventory in the balance sheet. Then you do an inventory count and you have a huge variance because you actually haven't received that inventory for, right? So getting a good process in place there. Um, so call bullet point one on that, payment you made for an asset that isn't here yet and how does it hit your books, right? So having, uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you should have a prepaid inventory account on your balance sheet uh, that accounts for that, as well as the vendor you're paying or the uh, the vendor you're paying. You should have like a prepayment or a negative AP on there to account for at a later date. Um, receive but not built. What does that mean? Basically, you've received the product um, at your warehouse, but you haven't been building, right? So basically, you received in your warehouse, uh, but not communicated accounting. So this is a lot of times we see, right? You have your, your 3PL or your warehouse folks over here. You have your accountants over here. Well, yeah, I receive goods, but there's no communication or not a good workflow or process from here into there, right? So basically, if you don't have that good process in place, then your inventory, your asset is actually increased in the warehouse, but it's not properly increased in the books and records that you're accounting for, which causes variances when you do month-end close, month-end inventory count process, things like that, right? Um, Additionally, you're not a, a accounting for accounts payable or bill accrued. So let's just say you you know received that 25 grand in inventory, accounting doesn't know about it. Well, we don't have that in accounts payable or as a liability or in our short-term cash flow plan to pay for. That really can affect short-term cash flow planning for your business, right? So having a good process in place for that aspect of received but not billed is is a big aspect um, of this, and then prepaid inventory as well. So basically. What Deer and, and Sin7 offers is essentially is a kind of a crude inventory function, function where they have uh, goods received, not invoice, so goods received but not billed yet, and as well as goods billed or goods invoiced but not yet received. So it kind of goes in those same buckets and it's got a good accounting mechanism that impacts and directly accounts within QuickBooks Online for those aspects. So um, just one thing to think about again, and you know, complexity number six, prepaid versus unbilled inventory. We're good on this one. Thanks, Brad. I wanted to give uh, Kevin a chance to talk a little bit about core more broadly. We've talked a lot about inventory accounting, but many people might not know kind of all the things that you can do in core. So uh, Kevin, I want to give you a chance to kind of talk about core a little, a little more broadly. Yeah, no, thanks, Stephen. Yeah, up to this point, we've really you know, touched in on those accounting complexities, but how, how does core come in and really affect all areas of the business and really connect that ecosystem? Um, every day we're talking with customers and you hear a common trend across across those uh, prospects and customers is their business have segmented or disparate parts of the business that aren't communicating with each other. You have purchase orders that are living over in these spreadsheets or in this email address. You have sales orders coming in from these multiple channels and then maybe someone's inputting them into one system or again, multiple spreadsheets. And then after that, you know, it, it goes to the the warehouse and the warehouse has a process in place and no one's actually sure what's where and when. And a conversation I had a few months back with a prospect kind of, I think really resonates with that kind of situation. Um, I was working with this prospect and um, asked him what the challenges were that they were currently experiencing. And he told me that he doesn't feel like he's in control of the business. Um, naturally, I asked, you know, what he meant by that. And he went on to explain that currently he doesn't have a clear picture of what stock he has incoming, where it's coming from or going to. He doesn't know exactly what he has in the warehouse that's available to sell at a specific moment in time. And then the nail in the coffin for him, which is you know driving the search, is recently he had a customer call him to let him know that they were never invoiced for a sale and that they haven't paid for that yet. Luckily, this was a, a nice customer and called him to let him know that. But for him, that just really drove home the point that he needs something in place that can give him that visibility. Um, this is where Core really comes in 
and uniquely solves those situations. Core becomes that single source of truth across all aspects of the business. So we're integrating in with your sales channels, whether that's one or many, your warehouse locations, whether that's a physical warehouse, that co-manufacturer consignment, whatever that looks like where stock is stored, your purchase orders. So having visibility to all those in one place and knowing when those shipments should be arriving or when they do arrive, getting that stock checked in quickly and effectively. And then for those that are handling manufacturing, bringing that in. So we know when sales orders come in and then where they're at in that manufacturing process. So what Core really allows you to do is create workflows that are scalable across the business, links the business together so you don't have that siloed data and information, and provides accurate real-time reporting that's going to give you control of your business moving forward. So, you know, Core, it really becomes that source of truth, connecting that business, giving you that accurate information that not only helps the accounting side, but the whole business function as a whole. So with that, I'll turn it back over to, to Stephen as we move on to the next part of the webinar. Hey, thanks, Kevin, and thanks, Brad. So I want to bring Keeley into the discussion here. Um, just a reminder, Keeley is an operational consultant at Ground Up, but she also has started her own business, right? And she's even been on Shark Tank. So a lot of great experience um, to discuss. So I'm actually um, going to stop sharing my screen so that you guys can see all of our faces. And uh, Keeley, welcome, and thanks for joining us. Can you tell us kind of a little bit about Ground Up and, and your role with the company? Yeah, so Ground Up is a really great uh, Portland, Oregon based company started by two women. They are, it's a nut butter company and they employ women who are coming out of adversity, whether that be prison system or domestic violence. Um, it's really an awesome, purposeful business. And, but at its core, and at its core, they make, you know, nut butter from various components and there's a lot of complexity there. Um, beyond all the stuff that the founders want to spend their time doing on the hiring side and really working on their purpose. So I came in as an operational consultant because these two founders were trying to understand what sound like really basic questions. And I remember, you know, I, I have my own uh, natural foods business investors or other people or what have you saying, you know, you just got to know your margins by product. Like it was the simplest thing in the world, or, you know, you just got to know your bottom line and what you're making in every channel. Like you could just snap your fingers and have that information. And um, it's they're simple questions, but it's complex as you guys just went through. So we ended up working with Accountfully for my last business. So I also suggested to this um, these women that they work at Ground Up that they work with Accountfully, and because of that, we've worked with Deer and now since now since seven twice. I've done the implementation twice with these two businesses, and um, you know I think without a system like this, it's very difficult to answer those simple questions because you need to be able to know what you're making, what you're making it with, how much it all costs, all these details. Uh, and it's been really empowering to see how it's given this business the ability to chart their path forward. If you want to ask questions like, where should I double down? Where should I, you know, I just got a hundred thousand dollar grant. What business line should I invest in? What product should I launch next? If you're a business like Ground Up and you're focused on profitability, unless you know your margins by channel and product, you really can't answer those questions. So doing something like this, even though you know these prior slides have showed what a lift it can be, there's a lot to think about and a lot to do, can really add a lot of clarity to your business. So it's been really, really cool to see how that's helped this great business set themselves up to be able to scale now that they're in a position to do that. That's awesome. And you've touched on this a little bit, but kind of what have you or maybe some of the folks at Ground Up liked about using both Accountfully and, and Sin7 Core, formerly Deer? Well, I do think it's really important if you're going to work with an inventory management system that whoever's doing your accounting be either already familiar with it or like awesome at learning alongside of you, because otherwise you're going to end up doing a lot of the accounting. There's just, it's so interconnected, all these transactions that are going back and forth between your accounting system and Deer. Um, and with Ground Up, we initially implemented Deer and then brought Accountfully in later as we, it became very clear to us that a traditional bookkeeping setup that didn't have experience with an inventory system wasn't going to be the right fit to make it possible. Um, you really have to understand all of the intricacies of how it works. It kicks out a lot of different little transactions, whether it's a sale or a purchase or a um, inventory adjustment or any of these things. And it having someone who has experience with that definitely makes the whole process smoother. 
one of our big learnings. The experience really helps. Is that is that kind of how you build trust with the, uh, you know, going to these vendors with you know, basically almost the keys to your kingdom is 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 can be a tough decision for some companies. Um, and how important is kind of trusting trusting those vendors? Well, it's really important, but I also think there's just no replacement for as the founder, as the person running the business to familiarize yourself with how the systems work, right? The, the worst thing as a founder is to get caught off guard. Like you get your financials and they look totally different than you expected and you don't understand why. Um, I think one of the hard things about being an entrepreneur that I experienced and that, you know, I see with my clients is that you you do need to have a high level understanding of this is anyone joining this webinar, you know, you're doing that for yourself, right? By being here is understanding how does it work? What should I be thinking about before you pass it off? You don't have to understand every journal entry your accountant makes, but I find it really helps with the relationship. If you understand things like when do we record sales when they ship or not, right? Like understanding those sorts of um, fundamentals will really help you trust your accountant because ultimately you want to be able to check in and make sure things are done correctly. You don't need to be a bookkeeper to do that, but you should have some basic roles and functions. And if you notice those aren't being followed, then you need a different partner. Um, if you don't have that basic understanding, it can feel very stressful. And that's that's a service that I provide by being a consultant. I think that can be really helpful when you're making a transition like this is having your own consultant who has all that familiarity um, and who's on, you know, your team for the interim and who can do things like play, check, check to make sure that your accounting team is following through on what they said they would do for you um, because they're not all created equal and not everyone is, um, you know, not every third party you'd hire for your company is going to do it exactly the way you want. So right. uh, I think putting some checks in place and not just blind trust is 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 key to feeling like you've got a good partner. Yeah, that makes that makes complete sense. And I guess my last question, I don't know if, if anyone else has questions for you, by the way, if you're attending, you can submit questions kind of for any of us, including Keely, but for anyone who's going through this process now of, of you know, they're looking at outsourcing their accounting, or maybe they're looking at bringing on an inventory management solution. Do you have any kind of any other advice for them going through this process multiple times at multiple different companies? Yeah, I mean, as much as we're all talking about how great it is and the benefits, uh, you can do it too early, right? Like there's there's absolutely nothing wrong with using a spreadsheet to track your inventory and having these big adjustments at the end of the month where everything that you sold is, is one cogs bucket and you don't know to what channel, you don't know to what product for a little while while you're getting started, while you're still small, because you've got bigger things to work on. If you don't have a team, you don't have an operations manager who's going to be doing all these dear entries. No system is perfect. Nothing, it's not going to read your, your mind. You're not going to be able to think, huh, I guess that inventory moved yesterday and it just magically appears in deer, right? It's still a lot of work. So, you know, for companies that are sub 1 million, certainly, I I believe, especially for inventory-based companies, sub 1 million, you're likely not going to have a big team. You're likely going to still be trying to figure out product market fit and all these other big questions that are much more essential to the survival of your business. I would say stick to the spreadsheet. And then when you have a little more um, traction and you have a team, then this stuff can add that next level of clarity so you can go out and really optimize your growth. But it's an optimizing tool. It's not a um, essential to starting your business by any means. So I think sometimes entrepreneurs really want to be totally prepared to have every system in place before they even launch. And that's not how I would describe inventory management. I'd say it's an optimization tool to, to help you grow. Yeah, I think we talked um, when I spoke to you before about there's kind of an inflection point, right, in your growth where you really need to to add a tool like that. Uh, you, well, we'll have to add the mind reading capability with the next update of the software. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. And also, I mean, a lot of entrepreneurs end up talking to advisors who started companies and sold them when they were like 50, 100 million. And so when you're getting advice, you're getting it from where they ended, not where they started. So they'll be like, oh, yeah, you got to have this great system and you've got to do this and you got to track that. But and it, it feels like the Oracle passing down like the map to success, but you've got to, you know, start small before you can get up to those levels. And not every piece of advice needs to be taken immediately. <laughs> it's like something I see a lot. Yeah. And I'll, I'll echo that. Um, as, as we've seen a lot of, of brands and clients that are 
500k in revenue. I want to do this. And it's like, okay, first of all, when you implement a system like this, having a, a good team or process to implement, but also ongoing support, like you need to be in there every day. You need to be receiving goods, assembling products, shipping products, all that type of stuff, right? How much time and energy is it going to take to keep the system up to date? Because we have seen a lot of implementations fail because a client wanted to use a system like this because they were told to use it. Yeah, we gave them, you know, if you're going to do it, you got to do this, you got to be in there. They never are in there. They expect it to be set it and forget it and just automate everything. That's not how it works. So it is a resource game of, do I have time, energy, you know, labor to help basically keep this up to date and accurate. And then once you do, it is an awesome tool and everything, but just making sure you're really thinking it through because it's definitely not an essential. As um, Keely said, we can set up a, a, a much more time efficient, cost efficient, manual reporting mechanism that gets you very close to where you are as you grow, then as you get to that point, then implementing and optimizing and creating more efficiencies in your decision making and reporting is, is where, you know, since having core can come into play. Awesome. Thank you, Keely. And thank you, Brad. I do want to um, get over to Q&A. We got a few questions submitted. But actually, before that, I wanted to mention, um, again, thank you for Accountfully for joining. You can visit accountfully.com. There's a way to request time to talk to someone, Brad or one of his colleagues, if you want to know more about what Accountfully does. I would also encourage you to go to sin7.com. Um, the core product formerly Deer, you can actually request a trial right there on our website on the home page. Um, to Keely's point, hey, if you want to find out if it's right for you, there's a there's a 14-day free trial. You can also request a demo if, if that's something you want to do. So definitely go check out our website, sin7.com. Uh, and accountfully there. Now, let me, we have a few questions that were submitted. So I'll open these up to all of our speakers here. Now, the first question, are there any templates available to assist with setup? Uh, for example, I've done inventory, but I don't know if I set up inventory for, for a food client. Um, Kevin, I don't know if you wanna take that um, as far as like templates. I know we've published some stuff on our website. Um, is that something that, that we can speak more on now, or I think you're on mute, Kevin. Yeah, so throughout the system, we have, as far as like setting up inventory in the system, templates and help articles on that, but we could always uh, follow up with it more uh, detailed as far as what you're specifically looking for when setting up a, a food client. Awesome, yeah, we can definitely, I won't call a person by name, but we can definitely reach out to the, uh, to the person uh, via email and, and get a little more detail there. Uh, the next question is, uh, how do you recommend handling inventory management connections uh, to if you have different business entities across different geographies? Yeah, so the, I, mean, I guess that one's for, for on my side and feel free to jump in if anyone else has more to add, but setting up Multi-entities, so if, yeah, if the businesses are separate entities, separate accounting, we do have the ability to create multiple instances of a SIN7 core account, allowing you to toggle back and forth if you have access to all those businesses. And then at the same time, we can have deer-to-deer -deer networking, allowing you to, if you need to send you know, a PO from one, create an SO in the other, it can automate that process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess the other, <clears throat> other question, if, it, if it's actually one entity or one business entity, across different locations, right? And you have one SIN7 or, you know, Deer file, you can segment uh, reporting via like the class function, division function that then also syncs down to QuickBooks Online that can help kind of segment your, uh, your divisions or locations as well. But it really depends upon if it's different entities or not. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Kevin. I think probably all three of our speakers could probably answer the next question. Uh, how about forecasting and reordering from contract manufacturer or packing for the bomb. Keely, how do you do that? Do you yeah, so, I mean, I inevitably end up working in Excel um, to do this sort of thing because it really, every business is different. So, I mean, what what is nice about Deer is that so many of the core elements or since seven, so many of the core elements you need to build whatever you want outside of since seven are available to you. So you can download all your bombs, you can download all your past sales, you can download all these reports and then make them speak to each other however you want in Excel. So the way we do it at ground up is we pull, we, you know, we pulled all of our bombs and we pull them regularly because they're always changing or we're adjusting recipes or whatever. 
Um, and then we'll pull our past sales and we'll use that to forecast how much we'll need based on, you know, what we sold in the past and what we want to sell in the future using the bombs as the core numbers that drive how many almonds we'll need or how many jars or what have you. There's a, a lighter weight do it way to do it in Zen 7 where you can go in and try to, you know, create an assembly and it will tell you how much you'd need for that assembly. Um, that's very a much more straightforward way to do it where you just go, hey, I'm going to go make a thousand cases and you press the button to, to see how much you would need and it will refresh it for you because we have some, you know, so many products to ground up and more complexity. It makes sense to do it in Excel, but there is a lightweight tool that we've used in Sin 7 to do that, just to get a quick glimpse at how many jars we'd need or something like that. Yep. All right. Thank you. The next question, are there any reports that will show cost of goods sold for customer invoices that have been paid but not yet shipped? Um, so interesting question. I think so go ahead, Brad. So just kind of walk through the, the, the mechanics of this. When on a customer invoice or a sale, uh, you're able to do uh, an invoice date, which basically recognizes revenue and uh, account for accounts receivable. And then the ship date, which is, you know, the cost of goods sold date, um, basically that have been paid, but have not yet been shipped. So essentially, like, I'm not, it's kind of a confusing question, but you're able to see, uh, you can invoice a customer without shipping them product and they can pay you without even shipping the product with the two different steps in, 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 um, in SIN 7 core. On their end, they probably should receive the product first or depending upon the terms of the relationship, unless it's prepaid. Um, so in short, how the accounting and, and SIN 7 core integrate, yes, you can get these reports in terms of what invoice has been paid, what has not been paid and what hasn't been shipped yet as well. All these, you know, screens are in there and, and reports you can see. Yeah. And just to tag on, if you wanted to see the cost of goods sold once it ships, then you could pull a report that shows the value of the product on hand. And then you could, you could see what you would be shipping and how much it costs you to make. If you wanted to know like, Hey, this, I sold it for $10,000. I want to know how much it costs me to make it before I even ship it. You could go find that information in, in Sin 7. Uh -huh. Thank you guys. Appreciate that. Um, there's also a few, a few very more specific questions in here. Some of them we're going to have to answer, I think, via email, uh, but we'll definitely get to all these questions. Um, somebody asked if the webinar is going to be recorded and sent out. Yes, we'll, we'll send out the recording to anyone who maybe jumped on a few minutes late. Um, there's another question. Does Deer slash Sin7 Core offer financial reports like balance sheets? Uh, or PNL, because uh, that essentially replace Zero or QuickBooks Online. Um, we do integrate with both of those things, uh, whether that replaces them or not. Um, that's a probably a longer question and specific to your use case. But um, I don't know, Kevin, if you want to answer the question about uh, financial reports like uh, balance sheets and profit and loss. Yeah, so we we have different reports that we could pull in there and we can definitely get some examples over to you as far as like exactly what you're looking for there, but we can pull up uh, Excel's forecasting reports and things along those lines. Yeah. And, and I'll touch base on, yeah. on the question here related to like a balance sheet. You can <clears throat> use SIN 7 core by itself as the general ledger, your financial reporting. It does have that functionality. Um, the actual accounting and in, 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 in how you do that is not very well done versus how you can use like a zero or a QuickBooks online, right? So number one, I wouldn't advise to it. I would advise dear, you know, since I'm a core to use from an inventory management, sales, AR, transferring that aspect, and then set up the integration to QuickBooks and or zero properly to then kind of create your efficiencies in, in your accounting and financial reporting. Remember, when you're running a business, QuickBooks Online is here, right? That your general ledger or zero. There's a thousand other things that are going on with your business that aren't just related to inventory, right? So you can use Sin7 Core for all your inventory management, all sales flow through everything like that. But what about your payroll system? What about your bill payment system? What about your expense management system? Expensify, bill.com, Gusto. Uh, what about your reporting dashboard? If you have like a Fathom or things like that, right? Well, none of those really integrate directly with Sin7 Core, but they integrate well with QuickBooks Online. So you understand kind of what the whole... 
um, in the day and age we live now of open APIs, software as a service, like identify what really these systems do well and what you need. And then a lot of, all of them share data between each other and how can you set up efficiencies and integrations between them. So in short, since I'm a core is awesome from an inventory management and ERP kind of uh, standpoint, as we've been discussing, just being cautious of how it's set up. And, and, and if you want to try it, that's fine. But just like, I think getting some examples and in, in, in conversations and dealing with people like us to tell you that's probably not the best bet or it is the best bet. Thanks, Brad. I think that's great. We have, I'm going to take one more question live. And then again, if you ask a question that didn't get answered, we have a lot of good questions here. Uh, we'll get you an answer in the next probably 24 hours via email. Uh, but this one's an anonymous question, so we cannot answer it. Uh, we have to answer it now, essentially. Actually, I'll, I'll take two more anonymous questions because we, we can't answer those by email. This one's for Brad, uh, specific to accounting for revenue uh, of the ship date. If the client is invoicing prior to shipping, do your clients use some type of deferred revenue accounting? Yes. If uh, two things in a perfect world, you'd have the same dates and you can, I think, and since I'm a car, you can set like set the, the, the invoice date as the ship date. If, if they're in the same transactions, if you do have like revenue in one month versus the ship date in the next month, you can easily pull a report into some core of like, Hey, which ones were shipped or invoiced last month versus here and do a journal entry in QuickBooks online. Again, like that gets some more complex reporting. Do you really need deferred revenue or not? Is it really material to your monthly financials? It may or may not be. But yes, like from a gap-based pr uh, perspective, from a financial reporting, doing that is, is the right way to do it. And we do that for our clients if they, if they want that level of reporting. Thanks, Brad. I appreciate that. Um, I guess the, there's another question about uh, SIN 7 onboarding. Um, I guess, does SIN 7 do onboarding for core or is it all through, through an outside party uh, a partner? Yeah. So. Internally, we do offer some implementation support to get you up and running. Um, it's more guided to support training on the platform, getting things connected. With the third party, you're going to receive more of that handhelding approach, working with your workflows and getting you set up uh, specific to your business. Our implementation is there to help, though, along the way. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate that. And and what's like how and this is just my follow up question to that. What's like the average? implementation time, I think it's much faster than the ERP, correct? Yeah, and really it'll come down to the business themselves and one, their their availability as long as, you know, what what they're doing. So, you know, manufacturing clients gonna take a bit longer than someone connecting a Shopify, bringing in finished goods. So it really depends on their timeline and what they're working to do. But right. it would it's not gonna, you know, it's not going to be as long it's as weeks, not, weeks, not months, yeah. I think. Right. So that's, that's an important differentiation between say an ERP product. I, I, I think that's, that's all the time we have for questions. Again, we can, uh, we can answer people's questions. We didn't get to via email and we'll definitely do that in the next uh, day or two at max. Again, I want to thank our guest speakers here, obviously Kevin from, from Sin7, but uh, especially Brad, from account fully and, and Keely. Um, thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Great conversation. Um, again, if people have any other additional questions, you everyone's going to get the recording. Uh, you can reply to that email um, or visit any of our websites and raise your hands with, with questions and we'll, we'll be happy to get back to you as soon as we can. Um, but with that, I'm going to close the webinar and everyone have a, have a great rest of your day. Thanks.